cool reaction, isn't it? This is an example of a reaction that's a delayed reaction. So before we go any further, let's talk about exactly what happened. So we actually have a couple of competing reactions going on in this flask. We have iodine reacting with vitamin C, and that gives us dehydroascorbic acid and iodide ions. Now, the spark notes version is iodine is converted to iodide in this first reaction. In the second reaction, you have this peroxide, hydrogen peroxide, that's converting the iodide ions into iodine. You see, it's a back and forth, a clash of the titans. Who wins? Well, in this case, we put a whole lot more hydrogen peroxide in there than ascorbic acid, vitamin C. So because of that, the second one wins out. When it does, the iodine then reacts with the iodide and produces what we call triiodide. It seeks out starch, and when it finds it, we have a blue triiodide starch complex. Pretty cool stuff. And it is a delayed reaction, as we said. But who decides whether a reaction is fast or slow? Well, we do that in the same way that we judge whether a car is traveling fast or slow. We do this with something called a reaction rate. So reaction rate is when you have a change in concentration of a product or reactant over a unit time. That's it. Now, we usually measure this in molarity per second or moles per liter second. That is to say, how much the concentration of that reactant or product changes over time. Now, something else you need to know. Anytime you see brackets like this around a compound, we're referring to the concentration of that compound. Let's use this equation as an example. The reaction between carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide to yield carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. Now, the rate of this reaction could be expressed in one of four ways. First of all, the reactants are going to form products. That means that as this reaction proceeds, we'll have less and less reactant and more and more product. The reactants are going to go away and the products will appear. Because of that, Anytime we relate the rate to a reactant, we use a negative sign because the reactants are going to be disappearing. So a rate can't be negative. So we put the negative sign in front so that when this change in the reactant is a negative change, it's going down, negative and a negative will give us a positive. So we could say that this rate is equal to the negative change in carbon monoxide over time, one of our reactants, or we could also express it as the negative change in the concentration of NO2 over time. Both are true. Both are the same reaction, and so both can be expressed in our reaction rate. Or, or we can use the products. Remember, the products are appearing, so that's a positive change, isn't it? So we don't need to use a negative sign here. The rate will already be positive. So we have a change in carbon dioxide concentration over time. That's another way we can express the same rate for the same reaction. And then finally, of course, change in nitrogen monoxide over time. Any one of these four will give us the same rate for this reaction. Of course, I know it always helps to have an example, so here we go. Let's use this reaction, and let's say that initially we have no nitrogen monoxide. We have a concentration of zero, initially. That's what the little i is for. The initial concentration of NO is zero. So we start the reaction, and two seconds later, we have a final concentration of 0 0.01 molar for the nitrogen monoxide. How do we solve for the rate? It's really simple. The average rate is equal to the change in nitrogen monoxide 
Notice that there's no negative sign because nitrogen monoxide is a product. The change in nitrogen monoxide over the change in time. So we simply take the final concentration minus the initial concentration divided by the final time over the initial time, the initial time being zero. So we have 0 0.01 molar minus zero molar over two minus zero seconds. That gives us an average reaction rate of 0 0.0050 moles per liter seconds. So for every second, there's an increase in molarity of nitrogen monoxide of 0 0.005. I need a break, so it's time for a cookie. Mm. Ah. 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 Oh. Ah. Ah. Nope. <laughs> a reaction always doesn't just happen. There have to be the right set of circumstances for that reaction to come together. First, there has to be a collision between compounds, like me and this cookie. Also, it's not enough to have a collision, right? I have to have the correct orientation. And then finally, there has to be enough energy between the compounds that a reaction can actually occur, like so. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's the stuff. So let's talk a little bit about collision theory. That's the idea that I was just talking about. Let's use the same reaction we've been using. And now I want to show you a representation of what happens when things don't go right, when these compounds come together in such a way that no reaction happens. This is why. For our first example, this is carbon monoxide and this is nitrogen dioxide. Notice that if they collide in such a way that the oxygen and oxygen collides together, it just repels. It just rebounds from one another and there's no reaction. Likewise, if the carbon monoxide collides with the nitrogen dioxide in such a way so that the oxygen and nitrogen collide, that doesn't do it either. No reaction. The only way for it to happen is if you have carbon colliding with the oxygen on the nitrogen dioxide. But if there's not enough energy in the collision to where these things can come together, there's still going to be no reaction. Sort of like when the cookie was on the table close to my mouth, but I just didn't have enough energy to get it into my mouth. It was very frustrating. However, if we have the right orientation and enough energy to make this reaction happen, then these two will come together to form what we call an activated complex. It's a temporary situation in which, again, both molecules are together at the same time, but in the process, new bonds are forming and old bonds are breaking. It could be that this thing goes back to being reactants, or in our case, it will move forward and become carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide our products. So to sum up collision theory, three things have to be involved for this to take place. Oh, God, I hate when it does that. Okay, so here are the three things we need. One, we need a collision. Makes sense. Two, we have to have proper orientation of the compounds. And three, we have to have enough energy for those compounds to come together and form the activated complex. We call this energy activation energy. Remember how I said that the activated complex could go one way or the other. It could go back to the reactants or forward to the products. Let me show you two ways this example can go. One is the forward reaction that we've been discussing. Carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide giving us carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. But then there's the reverse reaction. Carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide yielding carbon monoxide, and nitrogen dioxide. Let me show you the difference between the two using these two energy diagrams. The further we go up the y-axis, the higher the energy we have. So we have our reactants in this reaction. 
that have a pretty good amount of energy already, carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide. So when they come together to form the activated complex, it requires some energy. We call this activation energy. And we see it here if this is our baseline. If this represents where we started energy-wise, then this represents the energy that was put into this reaction to make it go to the activated complex. Once that happens, then we see the reaction goes forward, and when it does, energy is actually released in this reaction, giving us carbon dioxide and nitrogen monoxide. Whenever you have a situation in which energy is released in the reaction, we call that exothermic. So this one's probably a little easier to do than the other one. So again, if this is our energy going up, notice how low in energy the reactants are. And this represents all the energy you have to put in to make those reactants form that activated complex. Now once it does, it can go forward and give you carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide, but it requires a great deal of energy in the process. So this energy would represent the energy that's absorbed in the reaction. This means that this reaction would be an endothermic reaction. So it's sort of like pushing something up a hill. Once you get to the top of the hill, then it can roll over on the other side. It just depends on how much hill there is, how much energy it takes to get to the peak, the activated complex. Probably easier to do this, isn't it? where you have just a little bit of activation energy and it forms these products. Once again, if you have a reaction that releases energy in the process, this being our starting point right here, this being our ending point, if we are lower in energy with the products than we were with the reactants, that means we've released energy and that means it's exothermic. If we have a situation in which our reactants are lower in energy than our products are, that means that it required a great deal of energy to make that happen. And it also means that energy was absorbed in the reaction. If this is our starting point and this is our ending point, we're higher in energy. There was an increase in energy in that process. That means energy was absorbed and that means the reaction is endothermic. So here's your problem for the day. We have a reaction in which we have iodine and chlorine to yield iodine chloride. At the beginning of this reaction, iodine had a concentration of 0.4 molar. After four minutes, iodine had a concentration of 0.3 molar. So what I want you to do is calculate that average reaction rate based on these concentrations. And I want it to be in moles per liter seconds, not moles per liter minute. Okay? You can take a photo of your work and just attach it to the LMS. I don't know about you, but I had an exceptional time today, a terrific time. I think a lot of things were learned, a lot of incredible diagrams, probably the best diagrams I've ever drawn, no doubt. Today, we talked about a lot of things. We talked about rates of reaction, what they are, how to determine a rate of reaction. And then we talked about collision theory, how you have to have, first of all, a collision, how you have to have proper orientation, and you have to have enough energy to achieve an activated complex. And when you do, that requires what we call activation energy. Then we showed you how to draw an energy diagram and how to know whether that reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Hey, I had a lot of fun doing this. I hope you enjoyed watching it and I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit, maybe something, hopefully. Until next time, God bless you.